All right, so picking up with the anti-epileptic drugs. So anti-epileptic drugs have been used widely in psychiatry, and they're usually used to treat disorders other than epilepsy, right? And we've been using them to treat bipolar disorder in many cases, and I think in previous videos I said that lithium is kind of like the gold standard of mood stabilizing medication, and then really right behind that is medications like valproic acid or Depakote. So AEDs have been used to target the specific symptoms of psychiatric illness, so specifically the impulsivity, independent of their causality. So we're, we're kind of using these medications in, in, in many ways in symptom management. And that, that is indeed true of most of the psychiatric medications, right? We don't have a uh, medication that necessarily cures people of these things, but we have ones that make the symptoms more tolerable and more manageable. So although AEDs are widely used in psychiatry and are effective for their illnesses, such as substance use disorder and personality disorders, only two of these medications are actually FDA approved. So the two FDA approved medications are of course Valproate or Depakote for bipolar mania and Lamotrigine for bipolar maintenance. So both of those are the two that are really FDA approved. When you're initially practicing out there, especially as a young attending, you wanna kind of follow the guidelines and you wanna follow the medications that are FDA approved and make sure you're practicing with it in a safe manner, right? So you can actually get in trouble for off-label prescribing, and there was a big, uh, there's a big research study recently indicated talking about the use of Seroquel, and a lot of the off-label uses of Seroquel, also known as quetiapine, right? So those that medication was being used for all kinds of things. One that commonly comes up is things like uh, sleep. So sometimes, like there's no real indication to give a person an antipsychotic medication like Seroquel but the person gets it because it's sedating and it's useful to help them go to sleep at night, but that's not an FDA approved indication. And if people have adverse outcomes from that medication and you know it ever goes to court and they say, well, why were you giving this patient an antipsychotic medication like Seroquel, you know, you're not gonna have much of a leg to stand on. You're gonna be in a bad position, right? You're gonna have to explain, well, you know, I was using it because it's very sedating and it helps the patient sleep and you know, they're, they're going to look at that and they're going to say, well, you know, that's not really what another physician would do in that case. So, you know, you may be held liable for any adverse outcomes there. So just be aware of that. FDA approval and FDA approved medications is, is a good thing to start to memorize. So let's talk a little bit about valproate. So valproate is indicated for acute mania. It's also used for the treatment of alcohol withdrawal as well as impulsivity associated with TBI. So it's got a multiple uses. And I said at the beginning, you know, targeting specific symptoms like impulsivity is, is the way in which we kind of use these medications. Now, the mechanism of action for valproate is believed to be an increase in GABA levels in the brain. There's also potential toxicities. Like all medications, there are side effects. Some of those include things like aplastic anemia, liver failure is probably the big one. Monitoring of CBC and LFTs is of course important. So you want, and you always want to get a baseline too. So before you initiate a patient on something like this, you want to make sure you have a CBC, have an LFT uh, panel, and take and follow the levels too. So after starting the medication five days later, get the Depakote level, get the Valproate level, see where they're at, make sure they're therapeutic, make sure they're not subtherapeutic, and make sure they're not toxic, right? The other side, uh, the other side effects um, include things like polycystic ovarian syndrome. So that's a common test question actually right there is that they'll say, you know, why would you maybe not want to use Valproate for a young childbearing female? Well, I mean, there's two reasons. One, it's the most likely to cause uh, neural tube defects, so you gotta watch out for that. So obviously you don't wanna give this medication to someone who's getting ready to get pregnant. But besides the neural tube defects, is that you, people often forget the association with polycystic ovarian syndrome, so be aware of that. There's also pancreatitis, I think more specifically uh, hemorrhagic pancreatitis, increased ammonia levels, and the teratogenic effects that I already talked about being neural tube defects. So get your CBC, get your LFTs, make sure the patient's appropriate for the medication, and follow the levels, and make sure you get levels in, and that you're therapeutic when initiating this medication. It is a very, very good medication. Again, it's probably my second choice behind lithium. If I can't use lithium, then I like to use Depakote, and then other things come after that. Another one being carbamazepine. So carbamazepine and its analog, oxcarbazepine, are used for bipolar disorder and occasionally for alcohol withdrawal. 
Both are believed to exert an effect via inhibition of voltage-gated sodium channels. And uh, oxcarbazepine has been taking, getting a lot more notoriety lately in as far as for use in impulse control disorders. So it has a better side effect per profile than carbamazepine, less likely to cause some of the more um, serious side effects that we see with carbamazepine, and it doesn't have the auto-induction effect that carbamazepine has, where it sort of metabolizes itself or increases the metabolism of itself. So that's an issue that you're not going to have. And again, there's some pretty good studies out there indicating that oxcarbazepine has benefits for impulse control disorders. Um, let's see. So carbamazepine, yes, affects metabolism of many drugs, including itself. So you got to be careful. Like someone may be very well maintained on a particular dose of carbamazepine, and then over time, you start to wonder why maybe as you're titrating, you stop because you reach a good place, and you say like, well, why is that person doing well initially, and then they start to do worse and decompensate again? Think about the auto-induction effect, and think about the fact that it metabolizes itself as well. So monitor the levels. Again, levels is important. Um, I've already said oxcarbazepine has fewer drug-drug interactions, so it's a better choice if you're going to use one of these meds. It's rarely associated with grain agranulocytosis and liver failure, and some of the other side effects of both of these include hyponatremia secondary to SIADH and dizziness. So look out for hyponatremia and SIADH. I actually had a case of hyponatremia secondary to oxcarbazepine recently. So just be on the lookout for that and be aware that it could definitely happen. Last but not least, lamotrigine. I said this was also FDA approved, so lamotrigine is approved for maintenance use in bipolar disorder, and it's particularly effective in the area of preventing depressive episodes, so bipolar depression. It's also used to treat mood reactivity. Lamotrigine is believed to work by inhibiting glutamate release and inhibiting voltage gated sodium channels. So this, like we said, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine work by inhibiting voltage gated sodium channels. This one um, works with that mechanism, but also there's an inhibition of glutamate release as well. Bottom line with lamotrigine is it requires a slow titration, so you can't go fast with this. I believe you initiate lamotrigine at 25 milligrams, and then you can go up by like 25 milligrams. At, uh, over the course of several days. So it's like very, very slow process. It takes time to titrate this up. And that's because there's a really high risk of rash. And well, I shouldn't say high risk. I misspoke. It's not necessarily a really high risk, but it's the most life-threatening and serious condition would be Stephen Johnson syndrome or rash of any sort. So what the slow titration does for you is if you start to see any kind of rash developing, you could stop the medication immediately and begin supportive therapy and treatment, right? So the key is it gives you time to uh, avoid having any kind of serious complications and to make corrections. Other side effects include, of course, dizziness and blurred vision. So I think that's all I wanted to say about these medications. Covers most of your most of the basic stuff on these. Obviously, there's way more to it, so if you're interested in more information, go to Stahl's uh, Prescriber's Guide or go to Stahl's textbook and read up on these medications because there's a lot more to it. But um, this kind of gives you the introductory stuff and also you know, some of the testable points on these medications.